Well, I'm encouraged to see you, and uh, I don't know, I think I handed this out. It's about Greek noun cases, so if you were here, you have that. If you weren't here, you didn't get this, so I'm handing this around. And I know I haven't handed this out on uh, prepositions, so I'm starting that around too. Uh, and then there's uh, this thing. When when you get this, don't get too interested in this right now. We're gonna look at it. So um, it's actually a cartoon. But um, this is not the uh, the best quality. Uh, maybe you can read it if uh, if you get one. You see you can't read. Dig down in the pile. There might be a better one. And also be looking for uh, the uh, the alphabet sheet that has on the back of it this passage. So we're going to be looking at that passage in just a moment. And if you got the thing on the Greek noun cases, find that, and then we'll be looking at the other things. All right, while you're getting those things, Greek has a 5K system. Some, some grammars put it as an 8K system, but uh, that's most view this as a 5K system. And it's uh, a nominative case, genitive, dative, accusative, and then evocative case then, then if you find this thing it says Greek noun cases has that block on it the nominative is usually the subject and um, it also serves as other things like a predicate nominative and a, a uh, predicate adjective and we're not going to get into that too much I do want to see a predicate nominative and I'll explain that in John um, chapter 1 that we're going to look at, but uh, the genitive d is usually described source or can describe origin, and I think we talked about this the last time we met. The genitive case is represented in a very literal translation by blank of blank expressions, and that has to be interpreted because there are different types of geni genitives. So, for instance, if you had the phrase love of God, what does that mean? Does that mean my love for God? Does that mean God's love for me? It has to be interpreted. And sometimes it, I think it's deliberately ambiguous and it could be both. For instance, Paul says the love of Christ constrains me. Is that Paul's, Paul's love for Christ or Christ's love for Paul that constrains him? It could, could be both. Then there are things like uh, city of Jerusalem. What's the city? City of Huntsville. What's the city in that phrase? It's Huntsville. It's Jerusalem. And that's called uh, appositional genitive. Then you have, uh, like the phrase gift, uh, if, if I said uh, somebody gave me a, a gift of candy tomorrow, what's the gift? It's candy. So you have the phrase gift of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. Grammatically, that could be a gift we give to the Holy Spirit, a gift the Holy Spirit gives to us, or grammatically it could be the gift is the Holy Spirit. That's the appositional genitive. So uh, genitives, and it, it, next week I'll, I'll give a handout and we'll talk more about genitives, but it's source, it's possession, it's uh, the relationship of the noun uh, in that way. Uh, dative is an indirect object, and datives can also be used for agency, um, it's uh, Christ tasted death for everyone, a dative of means. By his death, we can have life. It can be uh, locative, and accusative is a direct object in some other uses of accusative. Vocative is a direct address. 
All right. Um, we're going to talk about uh, prepositions, but first of all, and again, don't think, you know, well, I have to memorize all this stuff. You don't. It's, I think, seeing things can help us use tools more intelligently. And you don't have to sit down and, and just memorize charts, or paradigms, as they're usually called. Um, just, we learn languages different ways. We learn languages sometimes just by hearing it over and over, or seeing things, seeing things. We might not know exactly what it is, but we see it and we see how it acts together. Now, we might become a little more informed and learn how it is acting together, and that, that can help us. But we've talked about the article, the definite article. Greek has a definite article. In, in English, the definite article, the, and we have an indefinite article, a or an. Greek does not have an indefinite article. It has a definite article. And so that means a word without a definite article, it's not always, it's not always the best thing to translate it as a or an. In, in, like in John 1, it says uh, the word was God, and God does not have a definite article in that construction. It's, and it's not saying the word was a God. It's talking about the quality of logos, the quality of the, of the word. And so um, the Greek has masculine, feminine, and neuter. But the definite article in the masculine is, uh, I'm sorry. It should be an eraser. Is whole to to tone nominative genitive dative and accusative and we're going to see that when we look at this thing about uh, prepositions all right look at this page here of uh, says greek prepositions at the top and it has a box Prepositions are like in, by, into, and prepositions can convey a lot of theology. There is a, there's a four-volume work called New International Dictionary of New Testament Theology, and the last volume of that has an appendix written by Murray Harris, and it's an article called The Theology of the Greek Prepositions. It's a very good article. And he, uh, I thought I'd find it online, might print it out or something, but he uh, has decided to write a whole book on that a couple of years ago, about 300 pages of the theology of the Greek prepositions. But you look at like Paul, Paul talks about being in, all, all spiritual blessings are where? In Ephesians 1, in Christ. That's the Greek preposition in. And it talks about into we're baptized ace into or for forgiveness of sins. We can go away from teaching. So this chart here at the top, prepositions are used with the three with three cases. With the accusative, the dative, and the genitive. And with the accusative, it's idea of motion toward or motion into something. And then with the dative, it's the idea, it can be on or under, but also in. And so when Paul says to be in Christ, that's the sphere of, of blessings. It's into Christ. And we, we're into Christ by, by faith, by living faith. And then the genitive is motion away from or motion out of. And at the bottom of that page, there are three prepositions that illustrate this. Um, somebody want to pronounce the, uh, the, the Greek right beside that where it says into the mouth. Ace-to-stoma. Yeah, ace-to-stoma. Stoma is mouth. The uh, toe is the, the definite article. Ace is the preposition. Into the mouth. That's ace with the accusative. Somebody want to pronounce right beside in the mouth in the next set there. Ace. 
Well, we have in, to, stomati, in to stomati, in the mouth. That's the, it's in, you eat the food, it goes into the mouth, in the mouth, the food is in, in the mouth. And then the third set is ek with a genitive, and it's ek to stomatos, out of the mouth. So that illustrates that block, that chart up there, into, in, and then out of. And this is just a, the way it looks sometimes, X, uh, it becomes X with a C before a vowel. Just like that sign there, exit. Just like X, O, O, DOS. The word for road is O, DOS with a prefix X. And before a vowel Omicron, it becomes X, X, O, DOS. X, O, DOS means the road out. So somebody want to pronounce the last phrase there beside out of blood? Ex yeah, ex hymatos. Hymatos is blood, and so out of blood. All right, any questions on that? Look on the back of that page. And here are meanings, and this, this I think comes mainly from classical, but it applies in Koine Greek, common Greek, the Greek of the New Testament. The Greek of the New Testament is common Greek. It used to be thought a long time ago that it was special kind of Greek, Holy Spirit Greek. But uh, there were discoveries found in uh, Egypt and other places uh, where papyrus and other things could be preserved, and they found things like uh, equivalent to the Walmart list that you wrote and left in the buggy uh, on a piece of paper. Uh, report cards, things like that, letters that people wrote. And from those everyday documents, uh, it was a wonderful discovery. It's determined now that the Greek of the New Testament is the Greek of the common person. It's not, it's not a special type of Greek. And that's usually called, and I know you've probably heard this, is Koine Greek. Common Greek. Koine means common. The word fellowship, koinonos, means what we have in common. And so there are various levels of Greek in the New Testament. There are some who, like Paul, is highly trained. Peter uh, wasn't, as Paul was. And God uses the abilities and the training and the education of these writers. And so there's different levels. Uh, John's Greek is usually thought to be... Um, on a pretty simple level. That's why when people are learning to read Greek, they usually begin reading in the Gospel of John and then the letters. So keep this handy and then look at this. Uh, now you may look at the cartoon. <laughs> the um, Adventures with a Lion or How to Preposition a Lion. These common prepositions are used with this noun, lion, and lion is going to be in different cases. And the preposition used with a certain case has a certain meaning, and it's on this paper here. So um, does somebody want to pronounce the first block to the right? We're going to go left, right, and then go down, left, right, and go down. Somebody want to do the first block? Or are we going to nominate Glenn to? <laughs> yeah, pros, tone, launta. Pros, tone, launta. What do you think the tone is in the middle there? The article, that's right. Leonta is lion. And that is in the accusative case. So from that, that other paper, find... Prepositions plus the accusative case, and what does pros mean? Yeah, toward the lion. So pros tone leonta, toward the lion. All right, we go down to the next block. <coughs> Somebody want to pronounce the one on the left? Pros 
Yeah, prosto launti. What case do you think that's in? So the article is ho to to tone. That's in the dative case. So what's pros with the dative mean? Yeah, by in addition to, but it's here, by. So he went toward the line, now he's by the line. The one to the right there on the second, the, top, the first one there, somebody want to pronounce that? I guess if you can see it. Epitone Leonta. Epitone Leonta. What case do you think Leonta is? I'm sorry. Accusative, yeah. It's an accusative. And so what does epi mean with the accusative? Look on this chart here. It has prepositions plus the accusative against the lion. He's going against the lion now. Somebody pronounce the one right under that? Yeah, kata tu leontos. What is kata? That's a genitive case. What does kata mean with the genitive case? Down or against. So against the line. It's two ways of saying against the line. So he's toward the line. He's by the line. He's against the line. <coughs> on the bottom here, on the left, might pronounce that. Peri tone launta. What's launta? What's the case launta? So they, they left the accent off, but what's the first one? It's accusative. This is accusative as well. Tone launta. So what is peri or peri with around. around? Yeah, around the line, like the perimeter. Of a, of a place or something. So he's going around the line. And then on the right there, the bottom right, somebody want to pronounce the first one? Meta yeah, meta to leontos. What is met? That's what. What case do you think? It's genitive. Yeah, that's good. What What does meta mean with genitive? With he's with the lion now, walking with the lion. Uh, that's just something that after you see it, you'll know it. But here is the the article: ho to to tone. And you have two as the article there, the masculine article. And so that shows it's genitive. So this is a, a nominative, genitive, dative, and accusative. So he's with the lion. That's a good question. Any uh, right under that one? Somebody, anybody want to pronounce that? Yeah, sunto launti. And what you want to guess what get what case? Dative. Dative. Yeah, it's dative case. What does soon mean with the dative? With. with, and it might mean something like with the help of the lion. So the lion has a stick. I don't know. Maybe the you know he's helping the the boy walk. It's going to get worse as it goes through the, the thing, but um, so, what was that with the lion, it's soon 
uh, told Leonte, and Leonte is dative case, and so soon with the dative means with, or it can mean with the help of. Um, soon is. Uh, with yes, and it may be the idea, the Greek of soon told Leonte could have the idea that the lion is helping him. Um, soon means with, but it's the idea of helping as well. Um, the, in Romans 8, the Holy Spirit helps us in our afflictions. And soon. And soon is a prefix that's um, on a lot of verbs as well. Any questions on the first page? All right, I spent a few more minutes. We won't get through the whole handout. Uh, turn on the back of that. We're not going to get to probably my favorite one. Um, we might uh, top left on the, on the back of that page somebody pronounce that parato yeah parato leonte and what is to leonte what case do you think yeah, it's dative case. What does para mean with dative? Yeah, it means with or near. Looks like he's getting on, top, on the line, but I don't know if he's doing that or not. He's, he's near the line, very near the line. Uh, <coughs> the next one, um, somebody pronounce that? Epi, and epi with, and that's a, an accusative case. Epi means against. Now, we saw something on the first page, on the second line, and the second block to the right, epi tone leonta. That's epi with the accusative, and that means against. So he's going against the line that way. He's against the line. Now it's probably the idea he's up against the line. So it's against the line. So he is um, next to, yeah, next to the line. All right. Uh, the one on the right here is pretty good. Somebody pronounce that one. That's a rough breathing. It's like it has a H in front of it, yeah. Who pair tone Yeah. Who pair tone leonta. And tone leonta is accusative case. So what does who pair mean with accusative case? Above, over, beyond. And so he's over the line, going over the line. Who pair um, isn't like the word hyperbole. And the word uh, for throw in Greek is balo. We don't get ball from that, but it, it works out well. Um, balo means to throw with the prefix who pair is a hyperbole to throw way beyond, to throw beyond. <laughs> the word for, or the word for parable is parabolos. And um, balo again means to throw and para means alongside. And so it's a throwing alongside, two stories thrown alongside. And I've learned in Sunday school, it's a earthly story with a heavenly meaning. So it's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning thrown alongside it. So over the line. Okay, the second um, line there, line, second line, second uh, block, set of blocks on the left. The first one, somebody pronounce that? Yeah, epi two, Leontos. Um, and, and that's epi with a genitive. And what does that mean? On or at. On or at. Yeah, now he's on the line. And then to the right, Kata to Leontos, and that's kata with a genitive. What does that mean? Damn. 
down. He's going down the line. The last set of blocks on this page. Hupo ton leonta. Hupo means what with the accusative? <clears throat> under. He's going under the line. And we have that in a lot, a lot of medical terms like a hypo what? Yeah, what does that mean? I'm asking, I don't know. I'm not asking. <laughs> <laughs> low blood sugar. Okay. Yeah, pupo is low. Under. All right, and then uh, this is probably my favorite one. To the right, that third block. Somebody pronounce that? The Greek? Yeah, ace. Ace tone leonta. And that's ace with what case? Accusative. What does ace with accusative mean? Into. Into. He's going into the lion. Um, in Acts 2, you have ace with the accusative for forgiveness of sins. Translated forgiveness of sins. That's ace for forgiveness of sins. It means it puts us into forgiveness of sins. It's for the benefit of forgiveness of sins. Um, one long time ago, one Baptist grammarian out of everybody else that's ever studied Greek came, came up with the idea and he said, Ace has a causal meaning. And nobody else, you know, agreed with that. And now, you know, a person by their theology may say, well, this is the Ace of causal in Acts 2. It's be baptized because your sins are forgiven. But the exact same um, construction is found in Matthew 26. Can't remember the verse. 28. 28. 26, 28. And it says that Jesus uh, is going to shed his blood, ace, for. Because of the mission of sins. Mission of sins. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. And that's, I think, a very good to look at that. It's the same exact construction. He shed his blood, leading to forgiveness of sins, so that there would be forgiveness of sins. So prepositions are, uh, there are a lot of uh, the theology in the prepositions. Okay, we're going to save the last page for next week. Any questions on this? Comments? Uh, it comes from a very old grammar. Mm, I didn't make this. I found this already made and printed it, but um, I think it's Great. All right, look at uh, this passage on the back of the alphabet sheet, I guess it was. <clears throat> Let's do some reading here. Okay, does somebody want to pronounce the first phrase right beside the one? Okay, in in R K N O logos. What does N mean? In. Yeah, it's in. It's a preposition. It works out all right. What does R K mean? Beginning. It's a it's a beginning. Ain is a verb of being, was, and what's ho logos, the word, and so in the beginning was the word. Now, we don't have an article in front of our case, uh, but John's not talking about just an indefinite beginning. It's in the beginning, and he's echoing, I think, Genesis 1. So, in the beginning was the Word. Uh, somebody, the next line may not be fair, but it's longer. Somebody want to pronounce that? I had Harvey Floyd for Greek at Lipscomb, and... Uh, well, I've probably told you, I think I lost a lot of weight during that time period. And uh, we uh, we had to go to the board and write stuff all the time. And, uh, you know, I always thought, well, if I don't look at him, he won't call on me. And so, you know, you try to act like you're doing something. And he'd send you to the board or you have to read. Uh, and um, the, I told you the word balo means uh, to throw. And we were reading vocabulary words one time, and there was a guy, he, uh, he 
I, he had the idea he wasn't ready for class, and so he'd, he'd stay out of class, try to get ready for class, and that went on for like two weeks. You know, you can't, you can't get caught up when you're missing all that <laughs> class. And then finally he came, and we were reading the vocabulary words right out of the book, and he was going down, down the row. And um, this, this uh, brother um, was lost, and Dr. Floyd said, came to him and he said, okay, read the one below. And he thought he meant pronounce Balo. And so he said, Balo. And Dr. Floyd's sitting there and he said, yes, the one below. And he went, Balo? <laughs> yes, yeah, the one below. Balo? And he'd change the accent back and forth. But All right, somebody will pronounce the next line there. Kai Logos, Aim Prost, Tom, Theon. Yeah, that's good. Kai Logos, Aim Prost, Tom, Theon. So Kai means what? And, and we've seen Hologos. What's Hologos? The word. Ain, what's Ain? That was in the first line. Was. Pros is a preposition. With. And ton theon, with God, yeah, and that's accusative case. So, and the word was with God, and pros originally meant face to face. So it's face to face, in with with God. Somebody said God created the world and created humans because He was lonely. No, God has the uh, um, has the fellowship of the Trinity. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Word was with God, face to face communion with God. All right, the third phrase, somebody pronounce that. Kaitheos and Hologos. Yeah, Kaitheos and Hologos. So what's Kai? And. What's Theos? God. Aim. Was. Ho logos, the word. All right. Um, this is not translated in the Bible. Usually, is and God was the word. Is that is that translation you remember? No. And the word was God, isn't it? With a construction like this, ain is a word uh, or is a verb of being. When two nouns are joined by word or by verb of being, <coughs> the one with the article is the subject. And so Hologos has the subject. Hologos is the subject. So, and the word, and Theos is what's called a predicate nominative. It's in the nominative case. But it's, it's just like uh, saying, um, Joe is a man. That's man is predicate nominative. It's describing Joe. It's not saying, I mean, Joe's not your dog. Joe is a man. So the word is described by this predicate nominative as theos, God. Now theos doesn't have the article, does it? It's not right to translate this, and the word was a God. It's, it's describing the character of Hologos, and the character of Hologos is theos. And so there are in this text, two different beings, there's Hologos, and then there's Theos. And Theos is the father, Hologos. He, he's going, we don't have to wonder who Hologos is because you remember what he tells us in verse 14? The word became flesh and dwelt among us. So Hologos is the second person of the Trinity. And the word was God. He's God in, in character, the same the same character as Theon in the line above. Uh, any questions on that or comments? Comments? Yes. The New World Mutilation says the word was a God. That's right. Jehovah's Witness translation, uh, mutilation would be as you put it. <laughs> um, and that's, uh, I used to have one and I just end up throwing it away. But it is pseudo scholarly. And they'll have little notes like the Greek doesn't have the article here, so it's translated. The best way to translate it is a God. They're coming from uh, 
from a theological um, presupposition when they translate that. There's no Greek scholar. I'm not a scholar. I can tell you there's no Greek scholar that would translate this, and the word was a God. Um, and so, yeah, that's the New World Translation. If you want to look that up, it's Jehovah's Witnesses. Any other thoughts? A lot of theology there in that first verse. Let's do one more verse, verse 2. Um, somebody want to pronounce that? That's uh, that thing over the uh, upsilon is accent mark, and then that thing that looks like a comma is a rough breathing mark. That means like you put an H in front of it. Hutos, yeah. N, Ain, N, Arche, Pros, Tontheon. Yeah. Hutos, that's a diphthong. Hutos. Hutos is a, a personal pronoun. He, what's Ain? Was. What's N? N, yeah. N. What's RK? The beginning, yeah, just like we saw in the very first verse. Pros, what's pros? What did it mean up there in the second line? Yes, with. with, yes, with. And then we have ton theon, same exact phrase, pros ton theon. What does that mean? With God. He was in the beginning with God. Now he's already told us in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. Why does he tell us again in this next verse? I mean, papyrus was valuable to, you know, to write another line. Why do you think he, said, he repeats it here? It's yeah, it's importance. He, which one? Hutos refers to whole logos. <coughs> In the end of verse 1, he, this one, was in the beginning with God. In other words, he didn't come later. He's not created being. He's going to tell us that all things that are created came through him. And so he, this one, was in the beginning with God. So we've learned that whole logos was there from the very beginning. And we've learned the character of whole logos is theos, or God, in, in nature. And then we're going to learn in verse 14, the word becomes flesh. All right, any thoughts on this? Any questions, comments? All right, um, just keep uh, trying to read through this at home. And, uh, and uh, if you see a word that we've already learned, and uh, just try to... to uh, work through this. This is putting us in touch with the Greek that John wrote. And I mean, some people say, why even worry about trying to learn any biblical words or languages when we have translations? Why even spend your, and there's a lot of things you spend your time on in this world. Why spend your time doing this? What would you think? Maybe you, maybe you would think we don't need to spend time on it. If everybody was honest, you could. Okay. In the church, there's always going to have to be people who are going to spend their time with the languages. Um, we can't just say, well, we have all these translations. Plus, translations, um, translations reflect the usage of a language at that point. There are, there are things in King James that we don't use words the way the King James used words. And so... Uh, plus, it slows us down, I think, and it can become a devotional exercise. In, I mean, these are the very words of God. Translation is not inspired in its words. There's no translation inspired in its words. The words of God are inspired in the original um, language we have. I mean, it's like preachers say, well, the original says this. And I think, you know, maybe some people think, well, there's somewhere I can go and I can, maybe it's locked up somewhere, but I can see the original. 
And, and we don't have any of the, we have maybe some fragments, you know, from that are pretty close. But this language, and there's a lot of scholars have been through this language and, and as we study this Greek and study Hebrew as well. All right, any thoughts on that? Uh, language makes it exciting. The jailer put Paul and Silas in the inner prison. Yeah. No, it didn't. He threw them in there. Yep, yep. Yep. The the, there. That's right. That's right. That's a good point. It's it, needed all the time for translations into languages where people have them. That's right. That's right. And it helps us also to evaluate the translations that we have and to learn. Um, I told you before, you know, I used to tell Hebrew students at Lipscomb, you don't have to know Hebrew to go to heaven, you just won't know what anybody's saying. <laughs> and that's a joke. But uh, uh, it's, it, and I think you can learn how to become a Christian probably from about any translation if you want to. Yet, there are translations that are better and there are those that are not so good. And uh, we, and, and even, I, I don't subscribe to the view that a little bit of Greek is dangerous. I think anything we can learn can help us in our studies as we give our time to it. Okay, any other comments, questions on the Greek portion? It's very interesting to me. It's mine. Moving. Uh, I was telling one of my co-workers that one had a class, and, um, and he had to study. I said, "You're studying Hebrew." Yeah. Uh, and in Greek, and he's basically learning the language. And he's like, "Oh, congratulations!" Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And he's seven advanced, and so yeah. I didn't know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if he wants to come, we'd be glad to have him. Uh, it does uh, keep the mind uh, thinking and, and wrestling with these. And, and again, I think, you know, if you, if you will, you know the alphabet, if you will, every day, you know, at the end of this thing, if you'll just try to work through a, a little bit, a verse or two a day in the original and think about that, whatever helps you can use, that's good, you know, but, but think about that. And it, it opens up some things. It open, it's not going to be like some big theological thing that you can't learn from a translation. But it's the difference between watching uh, television probably in black and white and in color. It gives you the color behind it. Okay, all right. Let's uh, get started on uh, the Hebrews, and then we'll take a break in a minute. And if you have the outline, we uh, we didn't meet last week, so and I have the outline for the wrong church. So uh, we are supposed to be on Hebrews seven, right? Hebrews seven one through twenty eight. That's uh, beside the date. Okay, we hadn't got there yet since we didn't meet last week. So we can't skip the passage that's before that, Hebrews 5, 11 through 6, 20. And we will work out how we're going to make this up in, in the future. Um, when is spring break? And does spring break affect any of you? First week of April. Well, that's even after this class, and that doesn't even matter. Um, <laughs> well, it's that, it's that week of April 2nd. Okay. All right, so if we pushed it one week further, that would be that week, right? If, if, of course, Pedro would be here on April 2nd. Okay, all right, yeah. Oh, that's the week of spring break. Okay. Um, the March, uh, was that 5th? Um, we might meet that week if you want to. I have no class here. Um, I'm going to be in uh, Montgomery for the lectures at uh, Faulkner on Tuesday, but i got to be back on Wednesday for Wednesday night. So if I'm here on Wednesday night, then I'll be here on Thursday. Um, and I don't know, maybe you, you might have scheduled some big world trip since we're going to be off that, <laughs> that week. But we, and, and I'm not saying we have to, but we might could make it up on that week. 
So we're on Hebrews 5, 11 through 6, 20. Do you have any comments or questions before we get into this? Now, what we talked about before. All right, there is uh, both in Hebrew and in Greek a relationship between the word for um, hearing and obedience, putting something into action. You, it, many times the word to hear is translated obey. Uh, a very uh, important passage in Judaism is called the Shema in Deuteronomy 6, and it begins, Hear, O Israel, Shema Israel." Hear, O Israel. And many times, Shema, Shema means to hear. And many times, Shema is translated obey. So it's not just hearing the words physically. It's hearing and acting on them. And the Greek word, akuo, we get acoustic from that. It means to hear, but it means also to put it into practice, to, to act on it. So and the word obey is an intensified form of the word hear. And so obedience and faithfulness to God begins with hearing Him. One commentator, William Lane, uh, has done a good job in showing that, and we talked a little bit about this in the uh, beginning introduction, that Hebrews could be, we don't know for sure, it could be a sermon that's been written down. And you have things that maybe point to that of the idea of hearing something. Listen to this. Hear this. And he begins the sermon in chapter 1 by pointing to God speaking. God spoke in various ways. But now, how has he spoken in these last days? By his son. By his son. And in chapter 2 and verse 1, therefore, because of that, it's the last word of God, and he's greater than angels, what must we pay greater attention to? What we've heard, lest we slip away or drift away from that. That's 2-1. And then the sermon continues in chapter 3. He quotes from Psalm 95 about rest, you remember? And what does he say in verses 7 and 8? Today, if you do what? His hear his voice. If you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. And so this idea that obedience begins with hearing is, is important. And it's essential, I think, to understand this text here in Hebrews 5.11 through 6.20. Um, let's do this. The first thing, I think, is let's hear this text. Do we have somebody who will read Hebrews 5 11 through 14 for us? About this we have much to say and it is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of, of righteousness, since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Okay, thank you. Somebody want to pick up and read chapter 6, 1 through 8? <coughs> Therefore let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance, from the dead works and a faith toward God and instruction about the washings and the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead and the eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tested the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then to have fallen away to restore them again to repentance since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. For land that has drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those 
whose faith is cultivated receives a blessing from God. <coughs> but if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being cursed, and its end is to be burned. Okay, somebody read 9 through 12. But, beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this matter. For God is, is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown toward his name, and that you have ministered to the saints and do, and do ministry. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Okay, somebody want to pick up 13 through the end of the chapter. So when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes, an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us, we have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. All right. Thank you to all the readers. It's 730. Let's take a break, and then we'll come back and jump into this text here. Okay. Uh, we're going to get back at this. What does this section mean? That's, uh, that's the question, isn't it? Um, before I go through it, do you, what thoughts do you have? What, any special comments or questions? Never stop growing as a Christian. Okay. Yeah. That's important, isn't it? So if you stop growing, then you're dying. Um, he, want, what, he wants to explain to them in verse 11 uh, about the priesthood of Christ, especially the priesthood of Christ in the order of Melchizedek, but he's unable to do that. And he's going to discuss that, and that's ne next week when chapter 7, he, he says, now concerning this Melchizedek. Why is he unable to do it here? Yeah, it, I don't think the emphasis is, is on the fact that he can't explain it. The emphasis is that they're dull of hearing. They're not listening to the voice of God. They're hard of, of hearing. We, we usually call the speaker dull. That's right, yeah. Yeah. I thought I was the only one that got that, Scott. This time it's the listeners. Yes, yes. Um. Developing a hearing problem is spiritually dangerous. Um, for God's people are called to obey God, so you have to hear God. In 5 9, he said that Jesus is the source of eternal salvation for who? Those who obey him. So again, it's, but this group has become dull of hearing, hard, hard of, of hearing. Um, perhaps they're fearful they'd be hunted down and prosecuted as enemies of the state. We, from what we have in the book, we don't have that they're undergoing a lot of persecution, but later he's going to say, you have, some of you have had some of your property taken. You're not yet resisted to the shedding of blood. But that might just be around the corner. Um, maybe that's the, the motivation for not hearing. I don't know. Uh, but they're no longer listening to God. Um, let me give you what I think the structure of this is, and then um, we'll go back to you and see what your thoughts are. There is, in 511 through 612, the peril of spiritual immaturity.
That's 511 through 612. And in this section, he, he goes back and forth between optimistic, well, he we starts with pessimistic, between pessimistic and optimistic. In 511 through 14, he's pessimistic. We have a lot, to, I have a lot to say about this, but you can't hear it because you're dull of hearing. In chapter 6, 1 through 3, he's optimistic. We're going to leave standing this foundation and be carried forward. In 6, 4 through 8, he's pessimistic. It's impossible to renew those who've fallen away, to, to restore them to repentance. And then in 6, 9 through 12, he's optimistic again. We're persuaded of better things for you. And so that's 5, 11 through 6, 12. The second section is 6, 13 through the end of the chapter. And this is on about promise. So peril or promise. And a basis for remaining steadfast is, is the reliability of God's promise. And so there's two options, peril or promise. By closing their ears and not listening, there's peril. There's, there's danger. <coughs> By listening to God in His oath and His promise, then there's, there's stability. Um, the first paragraph, 5, 11 through 14, is pessimistic. You're dull of, of hearing. So let me uh, turn it back over to you, see what thoughts you have on the entire passage. What, what is he saying? What's or, or sp specific questions you have? I probably won't have the answers, but... Question yours as far as um, context of the time of which he's talking about. Is he talking about since the church had begun, or is this all of the Hebrew culture all the way back to to Moses that they become dull? I think he's talking to the people that he's writing to. And you, you specific people that I'm writing to you, I want to write about the priesthood of Christ, and specifically Melchizedek and the relationship there. But I can't because you're dull of hearing. Right, but have they become dull? Because in other words, it's, they've lost what what Peter presented to them on the day of Pentecost going to where they are. Or is it the entire history of, of the Hebrew nation that, you know, they've heard it for thousands, Hundreds of years, um, and it it's just it's just wah, 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 because it's the same thing over and over and over again. So they they just tuned it out because it's you know kind of repetitious. Is it the total picture of the of of the Hebrew experience, or is it the Christian experience that they've in what thirty four years that they've? I think it's the out? Christian experience of these particular okay. hearers, these particular readers. It's the last word from God. Watch out. Don't lose what we've heard. And they become dull of hearing. They hadn't always been that way, he says, but you become dull of hearing. And there's, uh, there's this, it's going to be peril or promise if, if you don't wake up. I, yeah, think. I, was, I was inferring that since he brought in Melchizedek, that pushed it back to Abraham. And he, and he said, you know, Abraham didn't have, he didn't have anybody to swear to. And Abraham, I swear to God, was wondering yeah. if it was the entire, you know, Jewish uh, understanding that they've become dull. And that's true because that's what Stephen said in his sermon in Acts 7. You've become stiff, you're, you're stiff necked like your fathers. You've always been right. that way. That's true. But I think here in this context, he's saying, I want to write to you about this. I want to talk about this, but I can't. You're dull of hearing. He says in the next verse, you, know, you ought to be the teacher. That's right. Now. The time has come. But, you know, you're, you're not there yet. That's right. The, yeah. The, the present audience. Yes. Yeah. Any other any thoughts on what, what this means? Not just this section, but on into chapter 6. Why were they so concerned about the laying on of hands and the you know, foundation of repentance and the types of baptisms? It's a good question. Let me open that up to the class. There are two views. These are Christian things, fundamental Christian things, or these are 
things that are found in Judaism and they're fundamental but they they point to Christ and so let's that well, that foundation has been laid he says and they're Jewish people I think and that foundation has been laid but they, it points to Christ don't keep going back to that don't go you've gone you can go too far is the idea I think uh, I told you about my friend uh, rabbi friend who's a messianic rabbi Daniel Klustein in Honolulu and he told me he has some uh, folks sometimes Gentiles who become attracted to Judaism and they become attracted to the Hebrew language and a lot of the things. And he's messianic now. And he believes that that the Hebrew scriptures point to Christ and that Christ it, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And yet he has had, he told me, some people who become so fascinated that next thing you know, they're Orthodox Jews. They go back, they want to go back to Orthodox Judaism. They missed what what the Hebrew scriptures are saying about Christ and they're so fascinated they've gone back now to Orthodox Judaism and that may be sort of what's going on here you you this foundation has been laid I'm not going to lay that foundation again you need to go forward any other thoughts you want to give us your thoughts brother Ben this is a very difficult passage it is <laughs> uh, I don't think we can say exactly what it does mean but I am convinced that this refers to the Old Testament. The uh, leaving there is the same word of a man leaving his wife. It's divorce. <coughs> divorce yourselves from the elementary principles of Christ. A repentance, uh, don't lay again the foundation of repentance from dead works. I can talk 30 minutes about that, but I won't right now. <coughs> but the Old Testament things were dead works. They toward God not faith in Christ. He says faith toward God. Doctrine of baptism <coughs> is not baptisma. It's baptismos. And it means washings. The various washings of the of the cups and whatever the Old Testament. The ESV says Yeah, that's probably a better translation. It is a better translation. Yeah. Faith toward God. Oh, excuse me. Resurrection of the dead, laying off hands. Uh, the uh, Old Testament priests laid hands on everything, uh, transferred sins to animals and so forth. Don't go into that again. Resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment, not so much in the Old Testament, but quite a bit in the intertestamental period where the Pharisees and Sadducees had messed everybody up. And uh, I believe that, and I teach that this is from the Old Testament. Old Testament things, not referring to the new. You have to divorce yourself from this. And then, of course, I have something else in verse 4, uh, but I, in 5, 6, but I'll stop right there for now. Um, sometimes this, these are viewed as like the elementary things in Christianity, but I do think they're, they're not distinctly Christian. They do have roots in the Hebrew Bible. And so I think he's saying we'll let these things stand as a foundation, but they point to Christ, and you don't go back to this again. I mean, it's kind of strange, isn't it? In 5, he said, 5 uh, 11, he says, How do I get Siri to stop? <laughs> he says, uh, Verse 12, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles got so you you had need to the elementary principles and then in 6 1 he says therefore let's leave this and go on do, do i mean do they need it or are they going to are they going to go on from it and i think it's the idea of what these men in pointing to christ as as jews would understand that and he's not Knocking, whether whichever interpretation is, he's not knocking the fundamental. That's right. Or the foundation. He, yeah. He's, he, because he calls it a foundation. Yeah. So that's that's there. It's going to stay there. And, and I guess it's sort of like 
we think about our houses. I don't think about the undergirding of my house very often. But if it wasn't there, you know, I'd have some serious problems. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> To go back to these would be to go too far yeah. and to miss because these are pointing to Christ. Whatever, yeah, you know. I don't want to live on just the slab. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. The walls and the roof. That's a good illustration. Yeah. <laughs> yep. The entirety of the law was to uh, lay the principles of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Uh, like in Luke 24, he says that the whole. Uh, the law and the prophets point to me, the, the Tanakh. The Torah, the Nevi'im, and uh, the Ketuvim, the writings. All of the whole Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, points to Christ. And so, all of these things, I think, are pointing to Christ. But once you're in Christ, you can't leave Christ and go back to these things. You've gone too far then. Any other thoughts that you might have? Well, that makes sense, because I've always thought of this basic Christian principles and totally makes sense to me. Yeah, why are we going to leave? <laughs> you know, yeah. um, but well, I was going to ask you, well, what is it we're, I mean, I know there's more to it, but if that, if it was that, what is it we're supposed to move on towards? So that explains it if you say that it's the Old Testament stuff that it's Yeah, the, 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 the principles in the Hebrew Bible pointing to Christ and all of that. I mean, we've already seen you know, that he's greater than angels, he's greater than Aaron, he's greater than Moses, and all even of the institutions. Um, uh, he is the temple. You know, even the apostles, when he talked about, you know, uh, destroyed this temple, and then the, some didn't understand what he's talking about. You're talking about the temple that's here. Um, all of that points to, to Christ, I think. You know, that, that makes sense with the the overall view of the whole book because these were people who were falling back into Judaism. You know, when you look at the book as a whole, yeah. that, that would contextually yeah. you know, put another nail on that wall you know, to, to hold it up. Yeah, it, it makes sense. And again, I don't know if this is, you know, I can't say for sure. It's a difficult passage. Yeah. Um, so as far as the, you know, as far as the language you know, in 12... Through them in the six, as far as saying, you know, he, it, it was back to maybe the Greek. To me, I interpret what he's saying in the beginning there is it's more of a sarcastic question. It's not a statement that they need this. He's like, "Are you serious? Come on, people, are you kidding? You mean you have to do this?" It's more of that tone. So it's not it's not a directive. It's a, it's a sarcastic question. Um, and at the end of chapter five, is how I. Proceed. Yeah, I'm, I'm attracted to that view that he's using irony, that he's saying it's, it's been long enough and you should be teachers. All right. Well, I mean, it's just like, you know, when we grow up, there's some people that don't want to act like grown-ups. And, and, and they have the responsibility to act like grown-ups. It, it's time to act like grown-ups. And he's saying the time is past. I don't think they lacked the 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 knowledge they lack to accepting the responsibility right. and and that might be in a context of persecution I don't, I don't know you know for sure that's supposition well, I wonder too because just you know kind of human nature human tendencies it, it requires responsibility in other words to move on to the next level of maturity you are inheriting responsibility and you know, human nature resists responsibility. In other words, I don't want to be held accountable for something. And, you know, the, the old saying, you know, ignorance is bliss. Yeah. So it's like, okay, if I just, like you said, if I just stay on the first floor, and if I got to fear heights, I'm not going to build, I'm not going to work my way up to the 20th floor. If that's, if, if I have a fear of that, I'll just stay down here where it's comfortable. I'm on the ground, I'm not going to fall, I'm not going to get hurt. And they're just saying, hey, if I have to understand more, I am now then more accountable, and therefore I resist that. And that's probably what was driving us. Okay, I'll just stick to the basics, you know. And I can't, I can't, I can't mess up on the basics because it's just that simple and it's just that direct. And therefore, they feel safe uh, in that. Whereas if they have to understand more and the full depth and meaning, then 
then that, that scares them for the, you know, having to be accountable for it. Maybe they understood it, they just didn't want to take responsibility for understanding it, yeah. to act upon it. So they really aren't growing. Yeah. And that's what the last part of chapter 5 said. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in, in, you know, in the context of all this is set up on a discussion which he's going to come back to about Melchizedek. Yeah, he didn't just leave it forever. Yes, he's taking a, a concept that they should be familiar with that wasn't part of their, you know, their whole you know, Melchizedek did not really come up much in their, in, you know, Pharisaic traditions or whatever, but but he is taking elements of the Old Testament and he's and he's demonstrating those things are teaching something about Christ. They're teaching advanced things that you really have to think about. That he is a high priest that's not restricted just to the descendants of Abraham because he's he's before Abraham. Yeah. And so there's there's it's not that all the Old Testament is to be you know, disregarded and not, not really worth you know talking about. It's it's precisely what he's you know going to be talking about. Yeah. It's just in a, in a way that they have to sort of leave sort of basic kind of you know, principles, rituals, whatever. Yeah. And, and really think about the way God has operated in the past. And the responsibility that that brings once you, you have to hear. They don't, they can't hear, they're dull of hearing. In that uh, chapter 6 there, in uh, verse 6, when he said, you know, brought back to repentance because they're lost, they are crucifying the Son of God. Yeah. These are the ones that have fallen away. Um, do you think the ones that are dull of hearing have fallen away? Or do you think they're at the point where there's peril and it's danger? They can fall away. I think the ones that have fallen away are not here in this letter. They're not there. They've fallen away. They're the ones who have given up the assembling together in chapter 10. The ones here now who think, well, you know, we just been Christian for a long time, but he says, you're dull of hearing, and there's this peril of slipping away in chapter 2, and there's this danger, it's peril of falling away. Um, 5, 11 through 14 is pretty pessimistic, and he, he says, I think with irony, you need somebody to, you need milk, and you don't need solid food, you need to go back to the ABCs of Christian truth. They can't pretend that they, they hadn't had a rich exposure to the truth. They have. Uh, in, a, in one sense, they're mature and they need to accept the responsibilities of, of being mature, but they don't want to. Um, and he contrasts the milk with solid food and, and babies with adults in verse 13 and 14. And he says, you're asking for a milk diet when you should be on a a meat diet. And he defines it in verse 14 of chapter 5 in moral terms. Solid food is for the mature who by constant practice have trained themselves to distinguish good and evil. That comes through practice. It comes through experience. That's why an elder is not to be some like a newly planted plant. An elder has the experience of living this, living in the world and, and living for Christ. There's a, a moral claim on our lives because we're Christians. And so I don't think that they're spiritually immature in the sense that they lack theological insight. I think their problem is simpler and maybe more serious. They become like infants in making Christian decisions. And they stop listening to the voice of God. All right, any thoughts on 5, 11 through 14 before we go to 6? So he's pretty pessimistic there. 6, 1 through 3, he switches to optimism. Therefore, let's move on. Now, again, something doesn't seem to fit because 5, 12, he said, you ought to be teachers. You need somebody to teach you again the elementary principles. How does that fit with 6.1 when he says, leave the elementary principles, don't lay the foundation again? One seems to say you need to be taught the basics. The other seems to say you shouldn't lay that foundation again. Does he, does he or does he not want them to lay this foundation? I think he's being rhetorical. Again, it's a sarcasm. Yeah, maybe something like 
they need uh, teaching about the basics and 6.1 says they should not lay the foundation of the basics uh, again. How to use the basics in, in leading to Christ and pointing to maturity in, in Christ. Um, laying the foundation again implies they're losing sight of this pointing to Christ. Uh, it's almost like they've gone too far. And as we said, the striking thing here is that this list is not distinctly Christian. And it's probably, as some suggest, in pairs, repentance from dead works and faith toward God, pair one, instruction about washings and laying on of hands, pair two, and then resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment, pair three. There can be something here too also about this spiritual wisdom. Because I, I mean, I, I've known some some people um, that knew the Bible and basic doctrines of you know one church and baptism and male shift and so on, things like that. But they they didn't really advance much beyond that. You know, they had the found, they had the basics down. You know, yeah, pretty well, and, and that's kind of all they turn on most of the time. But and with all due respect, I, I didn't. Some of these two people I'm very specifically thinking of, none of them in this room or even in the state, um, I really regard them as extremely wise people. Yeah. And I don't mean they make sinful, stupid decisions. Yeah. Just that if I needed spiritual wisdom, they were not the people I was going to have. And so I think maybe there's somewhere for some room for some wisdom here too about this kind of harmonizing these two texts together yeah. to, to seeming the contradictory things together. That he's also saying you need some wisdom here. Because <laughs> they, it, and you get, it's like, you know, how do you get wisdom? You get a, a wisdom by making good choices. How do you learn to make good choices? Yeah, by bad choices. Making bad choices. <laughs> um, there's a story of a, of a teacher in a school system, and it was time for promotions, and she had been teaching probably about 10, 15 years. And um, she thought, you know, she's going to get this promotion. And then she was passed over, and someone who just started teaching got the promotion. And she went to the principal, and she said, how come I didn't get the promotion? I have 15 years' experience. And the principal said, no, you have one year of experience repeated 15 times. <laughs> and sometimes that may be what you're talking about there. Yeah. It's, yeah, it I mean, does, that, that's, that's very much, yeah. Um, I mean, does the passing of years always bring wisdom? Yeah. Yeah. It, should. it should. Does it always? I've known some older people that were not wise. And I've known some younger people that were very wise beyond their years. And it, it comes, I think, through what we do with the experience. Like he talks about here, of uh, having our senses trained to discern good and evil, as the New American Standard says. Um, and then like in the book of Proverbs, uh, Proverbs says it's written um, and begins with the concept of the fear of the Lord. And it gives seven um, infinitive statements to do this, to do this, to do this. And one of those is to discern, to be discerning. And the Hebrew word for discerning means, um, it means making a, a choice between Things it's actually a form of a of a particle that means between, and so it's making. Sometimes it's it's clear, more clear cut in making a choice between what's clearly good and what's clearly evil. Sometimes it's more refined in making a choice between what is good and what's better. And I think as we get experience and making decisions, and we learn that, and we that's how we gain wisdom. I think so. Yeah, I'd agree with you, Scotty. Well, and it's, you know, if, uh, if all you ever, you know, as a, just, I guess a little bit of an illustration, if all you ever build is the foundation and they ask you to build a wall, and you're like, I don't know how. Yeah. <laughs> Got a foundation. Yeah. And the sad thing is when a teacher in the church or a preacher decides he doesn't need to know anymore. Yeah. I yeah. saw that happen at age 25 with a young man. He's mm. been preaching now seven years. I know all I need to know. <laughs> I'm going to coast the rest of my life. He's a better man than me, then. <laughs> Seven years. 
<laughs> yeah, I've been preaching about 30 or something. I'm not at that point. Um, the more I study, the dumber I get. That's the way I am. And it's, uh, and I do think God honors um, the desire to want to understand His Word. If you don't want to understand His Word, I don't think you'll understand it. Alexander Campbell talked about um, different things that separate us from the Word, and he said we must come um, with an understanding distance. And that means a desire to understand God's Word. And I'm not talking about anything like you might hear somebody say the Holy Spirit working on somebody's heart. I'm talking about if you want to understand God's Word, I think God honors that, and He knows that desire. If you don't want to understand it, you probably won't. It's the same idea as like the parables. You hear just a little nice story. Well, it's, not, it's, not his, it's not His Word, it's Him. Yeah. We know the story's that. The Word is Him. The word is, yeah. You're wanting to get to know Him, and that's what uh, He expects of us. It's, yeah. it's a relationship. It's not, a, it's not a recognizing and understanding language or, or words or anything. It's, it's his essence that he wants you to have a relationship with. Yes, yeah, and he he communicates to us through his word. So yeah, it's a relationship. Um, so I think he means here, don't occupy yourself with the pre-Christian foundational preparations for Christ and neglect the glory of the gospel. In a sense, it may be going back to the shadow and, and not seeing the reality that, that's here. You know, Brother Ben, if we look at the Old Testament worship and New Testament worship, <coughs> we're all saying, yeah, the Old New Testament worship is far better. And it is. But look at the Old Testament worship. Got a $5 billion temple, and a high priest with a $10,000 uniform, and all these animal sacrifices, the instrumental music. The great feast days, the great uh, relationship you had with your friends, and then you pass from there and go to a shade tree with a little bit of bread and wine and somebody's hat and sing from memory part time and preach from memory maybe because you were afraid to bring a Bible and that's it. That's worship. It doesn't stack up. The Old Testament was made to be attractive to the man, to his five senses. But God is the spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. We don't need that attraction now. We need a spirit. We, we worship in spirit. We don't worship the things. We worship God. Excuse me. Yeah, thank you. There is, there is the reality that's here in contrast to the shadows that are there. It's like a picture, a photograph, and a person. Corinthians, when he says written, the difference between written on stone and yeah. on the heart. Yeah. All right. Uh, anything? There's Sorry. There's a couple of words in here that, that I thought were interesting. Uh, that may go to some of the root of the cause and then not maturing. Uh, in the last of chapter 5, he uses the word, at least in my version, exercised. Yeah. But you get down to the end of chapter 12 and there's the word sluggishness. Yeah. They're being lazy. Yeah. Yeah. They're not wanting to progress because it's easier, just like the when you go back to chapter three and the comparison coming out of coming out of Egypt. They're 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 coming out of Egypt, they're coming out of Judaism and, and worshiping the temple to Christianity now, and they're wanting to go back into it. They're being lazy because that's the easier way because that was comfortable and fitting. Uh, and, and that's what I, I see with those two words because yeah. you're not exercising your mind to, to move forward. You're just being sluggish and staying back where you were. Exercise is not fun sometimes. Uh, and the word there, exercise or train, is the word. Um, we get the word gym from that, gymnasium. and. Um, <clears throat> Verse 14 says, trained by constant practice. Yeah, yeah. This is a, a, a discipline. regular thing that you do. You know, Isn't it? There. There's a, a discipline. And, yeah. And there are, you, know, you might have heard, you know, some people talk about the disciplines of the Christian life. And uh, and that's important, I think. And uh, 
we are we live in a very dangerous time as a society if something is not entertaining to us we don't want to listen to it too much if it's a little bit difficult we don't want, don't want to hear it um, yet we're in a race we're in a battle and um, this is serious business so yeah thank you all right um, and so one uh, one through three of chapter six is optimism we're in moving we're moving on and then in uh, 4 through 6 of chapter 6, it's really severe, pessimistic. And this is a complex sentence that begins with, um, in Greek, in the word impossible. And, and at the end, it, it said because. Here's why it's impossible. It's because. And he says that there is this danger in verse 6 of doing what? What could we do? Fall away. So can a Christian fall away? It's right there, isn't it? Um, and there are some people who don't believe that a Christian can fall away, and so they have to read back into this the idea that these folks are not Christians, not believers. And they make such silly points as they've only tasted of the heavenly gift. They didn't really eat it. They just got a little taste of that. You remember back in chapter 2, what he, did he say that Christ in relationship to death tasted death for everyone? He had the full experience of death. So... These, in verse 4, they've been enlightened, they've tasted the heavenly gift, they've been made partakers of the Holy Spirit. By the way, before we move on, uh, to the end of verse 3, he says, or in verse 3, he says, we'll do this, but then he says, if what? If God allows. Isn't that strange? He, I mean, of course God's going to allow it, isn't he? I, I think uh, he's using this and saying you don't presume on God. It's like in Acts 8 when uh, Simon, you know, the sorcerer, you know, wants to buy the gift of God with money. And Peter says, uh, you're, you're in sin and you need to repent. And uh, he says, pray to God if perhaps God will forgive. Well, there are some people who say, well, God forgives. That's just what he does. That's his business. God forgives. But you don't presume upon God. Um, God forgives because He is a loving God, but it's not automatic. It's not the idea, okay, well, I'm going to commit this sin because God, for, and I'll, I'll repent because I know God forgives. That's, that's presumption. So, all right, so verse 4 then, he says, These people have been enlightened, tasted of the heavenly gift, been made partakers of the Holy Spirit, tasted the good word of God, the powers of the age to come. So that sounds like saved people to me. Then have fallen away. And he says it's impossible to restore them, renew them. Why is it impossible with God or where's the impossibility lie? And, and and they've fallen away from the only hope, the only uh, um, grounds of salvation. That's Christ. And you you can't be saved if you've fallen away from from the Savior. And so the impossibility is not with God if they repent then God would forgive. But he says it's impossible to restore them or renew them again to repentance. I think the impossibility is in the state in which they are. It's the idea of, uh, and, and you may disagree, but I think this is parallel to the passage of the blasphemy in the Holy Spirit and the passage in 1 John 5, the sin unto death. And If somebody says, well, I'm afraid, I've, if a Christian says, I'm afraid I committed that, the sin of, of the blasphemy in the Holy Spirit. If you're concerned about it, you haven't committed it. I know you haven't. It's, yeah, go ahead. 
Can I have three minutes? Oh, you may. Take, you, yeah. You'll have time to correct me. Yeah, no. <laughs> no, this is, this is such an easy passage. Uh, it's describing, as you said, people who are saved. I love for the Calvinists to get a hold of this. I hear them on radio, and they sweat blood. But uh, they, these people are saved. What, what's their big temptation here? Uh, thievery, uh, murder, fornication. Their big temptation is the law. This is what this <coughs> is about. If they fall away, to renew them again to repentance, it's impossible to do that. What does it mean to renew them to repentance? We have our, here's an elder in the church. You have anybody come and want, want to be renewed to repentance? I doubt it. There was a time on the Jewish calendar, six months after the, after the uh, New Year, there was another New Year, and then the month of Tishri came in. Ten days into that new civil year was the Day of Atonement. For ten days, they deprived themselves of their women and most of their food and repented, repented, repented so they would get a renewal on the Day of Atonement. And uh, the writer here is saying, that won't work. <laughs> you, 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 from Christ, you go back and try to renew, you, renew yourself to repentance. No, you can't find any repentance because you crucified Christ saying the law of Moses is better than he is than his way is and you crucified him again and put him to an open shame. There's no chance for you under the law. Just don't try. It. And that's what I understand. That's attractive. Uh, they have left Christ, and if you leave Christ, there's no, there's no salvation. You said it a while ago. If they come back, they can find salvation. Yeah, it, and the impossibility is with them. It's the, it's the idea of uh, the hardened heart. It's like you take Play-Doh and you can make something, you know. When my son was small, I'd, you know, he'd say, make a car. And I'd make a car and he'd say, it doesn't look like a car. And I'd say, it's a car. And it doesn't look like a car. And so it just might start all over. But you take that Play-Doh and put it out in the sun all day, what, what you going to do? You can't. It has to be broken. It's hardened. And there's a danger of... Uh, of this. Isaiah 6 talks about this, and then Jesus talks about it. Um, there's a danger, and there is a point of no return, and that's with us. And if you fall away, it's the impossibility of the heart. If you turn away from the Savior, how, where is salvation going to be if you turn away from Christ? And, um, and it may be like uh, you brought up there as well. Um, it's not a question if God can forgive, it's a question if I yeah, and if you have become hardened in sin, you won't repent. Right. right. What? Where? When is that point? Um, I don't know. Once a person's heart is not, is not tender to hear the word, then you reach that point. And, and you know, the, the verse really doesn't say it's impossible for somebody to repent. It says it's impossible for them to be renewed. Yeah. To repentance for their, their mind to change. Yeah. You know, so they, you know, if, you can't go through the second door if you shut the first one. <laughs> You've got to open that first one back up before you get to the second one. Have, have you not known of people, and I have, that would come to church for years and years and years, and many people <coughs> talk to them, other people talk to them? And they say, yeah, I believe all of this, but I just, I just can't be baptized. What do you do with people like that? That's their decision. I know a man now, very nice, uh, doesn't miss a Sunday of church. He's there every time the doors open, and yet he, they talk to him, plead with him. <laughs> He won't be baptized. I don't know if he's afraid of water or if he's just afraid to come forward. I mean, I'm sure they told him they can baptize him anytime. Yeah. But he just won't do it. So what do you do with people like that? You pray and you keep encouraging them, I well, think. he's really a smart man because he knows he's <coughs> and he gives his life to God. 
He didn't want to do that. He wants his life for his own. But he's not a bad man. I know, but he understands. He understands that. He's a hermit. Um, it is the decision of every person, and you can't force anyone in that decision. And uh, we're sowers of the seed, and that's all we can do. Um, this here is a deliberate, planned thing, intelligent decision, you're falling away. And uh, it can come, I guess, by increments, you know, but it's, the, it's deliberate. They've fallen away. And... Um, it's a choice not to listen to God. And he says then in verses 7 and 8, this warning is put in a perspective of a relationship with God. And you have a field, and rain falls on the field, and the ground drinks up the rain, and the field brings forth vegetation. That's use, useful. That's when we listen to God. But then you have the same field when the rain falls on the field, and it yields thorns and thistles, and it's worthless, and it's close to being burned. That's a, an illustration of this. You're that field, is what he's telling them. And you better watch out, and you better wake up, and you better listen. There are those who have fallen away. You're pretty close, and what kind of field are you going to be? So there's, there's the danger of peril here. Now, he says... Um, and as Brian brought up, that you don't be uh, sluggish. We desire this for you. Um, he's addressing this to them, and uh, he mentions inheriting the promises then. So we have about five minutes. Let's see if we can finish this. So there's peril, and then there's promise, the promise of God. Now, he's optimistic because he says that uh, we're convinced of better things for you. Things that accompany salvation, though we're speaking this way. God's not unjust to forget your work and the love you've shown toward uh, His name. And you ministered, and you're still ministering to the saints. But you have to show the same diligence to realize the full assurance of hope until the end. And he says that God has made this promise then. And just real quick here, he brings up Abraham. Where is that promise, the one with the oath found? What book? Genesis. Genesis, okay. What chapter? Well, the first one. Do you have a, a note in your Bible there that's showing where that's from? Yeah, it's Genesis 22. Um. The book of Genesis has 50 chapters, of course. Chapters 1 through 11, some label that primeval history. I don't know if that's a good word to put it, but it's, it's early history. And then 12 through 50 is patriarchal history. And that breaks down chapters 12, and this is just a, a rough outline, 12 through... Um, 25 is about Abraham. It's about really three people in this section. Uh, 25 through 35 is about Jacob. And then 36 is a genealogy. 37 through 50 is about who? Joseph. Yeah. That's interesting how that much space is given right there. Okay, so it's in this section here. In that section there, chapter 12 is the beginning of the Abraham account cycle. 22 is like a bookend to this. In chapter 12, what did God do? He called Abraham, leave, go to the land that I'll show you. He didn't, spe he didn't say go specifically to this place, put this into your phone, your GPS, or whatever. He said, go to the land that I will show you and I'll bless you. In chapter 22, God called Abraham, and he said, go, take your son, go to the place that I'll show you. you. Offer your son. In 12, Abraham went. In chapter 15, Abraham believed God and was counting him for righteousness. In chapter, in, in this whole thing of the, you know, God says that I'll bless you and I'll make of you many nations. He didn't have any children. 
And his name is Avram, exalted father. Imagine around the campfire. What's your name, Avram? You probably have a lot of children. Tell us about your children. <laughs> Don't have any children. And he and his wife, Sarah, and as the Bible says, uh, his body was as good as dead. And God brings this little child, Isaac. Um, and then you have, you know, the Ishmael and all that going on as well. But that, Isaac's child of promise. In chapter 22, he says, take the child of promise and offer him to me. And, and it, it's really, really dramatic. He says, take your son, your only son, the son whom you love, and offer him. It's just like, and I think Scotty and I were talking about this, it's, it's like turning the screw. And if somebody calls you and they say, there's been an accident, it's somebody in your family. It's somebody close to you. It's, it's the drama is building. And Hebrew does that. It builds it, uh, all this drama. And then in 22, you just have, you know, Abraham and Isaac. And then Isaac says, where's the sacrifice? And he says, God will provide. And, and God does. So, and then at that point, after that, God says, I know that, that you fear me, and he swore with an oath, the same blessing that he said, I'll make your descendants is like the stars, the sky, and sand, and sea. All right, the writer here says, see, God didn't have to swear with an oath because God's promise, he's God. Why does he swear with an oath? <laughs> it's for our benefit. It's for Abraham's benefit. To yeah, I mean, God swear. There's not many passages in the, in the Hebrew Scriptures where God swears with an oath. God swears with an oath for Abraham's benefit, and He says, "I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply you." And that's strong as you can put it in the Hebrew. It's a it's a particular kind of construction, and so. Patiently waited, he obtained the promise. And he says, men swear by one greater than themselves. And with an oath is the end of, of dispute. In the same way, God shows to the heirs of the promise the unchangeableness of his purpose interposed with an oath. And these two unchangeable things, the promise and the oath. And it's impossible for God to lie. And we have this strong assurance from God. And then... At the end here, he uses, uh, illustrates this, this high idea of hope with a nautical picture of an anchor with a personification of hope. This hope is entered into the veil, within the veil, entering behind the curtain. And that's referring, I think, uh, to Christ. And that's uh, Christ has entered as a forerunner for us and become a priest after the order of Melchizedek. All right, well, we are out of time. Anything that needs to be said? I want to say something. Okay. Thank you for what you're doing. Well, that's encouraging. I'm encouraged uh, by everyone who's here. Thank, thank you for that. All right. Uh, Brian, will you listen close in prayer? I have a thought of the for you at the end of this study for we learn some about your word. Father, we ask that you would bless us as we depart, watch over us, and guide our steps so that we may return home safely, that we may return to the world with a renewed spirit, that we may be an example to the world, that they may want to know what we have because of our example. Father, we ask as we depart, you guide our steps so that we may walk in the truth and the light. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks, Brian.